So with that, shall I ask you the first question? Yep. I want to give them a chance to ask questions. Oh, they're going to do that too, but I was asked to help open it up by asking you. Actually, I do have two questions. You can answer them briefly if if you wish so we can get to the discussion. The first is, Ruth, you have a very rich history in politics. And yet, in my discussions with many, with undergraduates here at Brandeis and with youth uh, elsewhere, there seems to be a real deep discouragement among young people about entering politics today. They see a kind of polarization that's crippling and that uh, leads to a paralysis, lack of an, any ability to reach compromises and consensus. They see Occupy Wall Street demonstrations uh, that perhaps is somewhat of a response to this. So from your experience, Ruth, can you encourage people to enter politics? And, um, and if so, how do we break this type of deadlock that we see, particularly in Washington? Uh, well, I would certainly encourage people to go into politics. That's when I said before, you will work in at least three sectors. Even if you don't run for office, all of the government work I was talking about before is working on political issues, learning how to make and shape policy, learning how to deal with some of the excitement, but also compromises of democracy. Um, In terms of what you describe as the current situation, let me just sort of sum it up. We continue in this country, sadly, to treat virtually all politicians with contempt. The consequence is we will get more and more contemptible politicians. We need promising people who see, who know an area, who learn an issue, to um, then move to to take those issues into the democratic marketplace and pursue public office and stand against some of the worst and ugliest ravages which you see all around you. We need some very smart lawyers to take on um, Citizens United and reverse the decision. I don't I don't like those. Um, so um, I would yeah, but I would just I think we should stick with international development for most of, much of this evening's discussion. But I'm happy at any point in time to come to a campus and encourage people to get involved in politics. Well, then let me hold my second question uh, until we get some some people in in the room and uh, asking questions or comments. Any, who would like to start? Yes, please. Good. Um, hi. Hi. Um, my name is Erica. I'm an international global studies major, and I recently watched a talk from someone with Engineers Without Borders who talked about many of the same points as you. And one statement he said that I thought was really interesting is that one of the biggest problems with international development organizations is their inability to grow from their failures. So I was wondering if this statement resonated with you, and you could, if you could think of any failures AJWS had that you grew from or learned from. Um, absolutely. So first of all, I think that's true. Um, I just, I think it's like the, one of the things, bizarre things in this country, is that people keep talking about um, um, non-governmental organizations needing to learn from business. And I would like to point out to you that business doesn't have such a great record in this country. Um, um, <laughs> It has severe problems of corruption. It has severe problems of not knowing the best way to raise and train leaders. Um, And many of its changes also don't work very well. So let's just suggest that all of us need to do more to learn from failures. American Jewish World Service just completed um, what really took us about two years of strategic planning. Um, And I would say among the things we learned are the importance of rethinking the role of a board of a not-for-profit organization so that it is not just a uh, fiscal steward but actually becomes a generative place for people to help us think through the issues we're likely to be facing as we do the work that I described to you um, and really engage in a planful way in doing that work with us because even as far a board is not that far outside an organization but I promise you it's further outside than a staff Um, And so really bringing lots of points to bear. I have several staff members here. I hope they would agree. I'm not going to ask them right now. But we do a really good job of trying to let every member of our staff know what happens in board meetings, know what our annual budget budget looks like, know what our strategic plan has produced, and get engaged in talking about how to keep making change in an organization. In terms of actual and direct failures, um, I would say that one of the exciting things is that there is so much ingenuity and change at the grassroots level 
that we have only rarely had to stop funding an organization because they were not able to or were not doing the work that they promised. But I would say that one of the things I've learned from that is to be very mindful of not giving people more money than they need, of not giving them money with too many strings attached. About a year ago, I was in Ethiopia where we have some very great projects and a, a member of the study tour that I was leading, a donor, asked the uh, director if he could, and it was flattering to me, because if he could say why he particularly enjoyed his relationship with American Jewish World Service. But I was staggered by his response, which was, basically, I am a small HIV AIDS organization. I have grants from 20 different international development organizations in five or six different countries. And only AJWS gives me money for general support. Everybody else gives me program money and requires that I maintain a separate bank account. I run a $50 million organization. I couldn't maintain separate bank accounts for all of the major people who fund me. And the notion that this guy in Ethiopia is being asked to do that by Western funders is just a good indication of where people go astray. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Hi, Hi. Um, my name is Kate. I'm one of the DICE impactors. And I, okay, you talked about USAID and a little bit of what they do and the event in Haiti and us exporting our rice. But as we know, Haiti is not an isolated incident. And USAID is only one of way too many organizations that are distributing our foreign aid. So I'm curious in that context um, and given all the budget talks, why, even in a time where we're supposed to be addressing inefficiencies, our foreign aid isn't talked about at all? Um, right now it's not talked about, Katie, because we have a Congress that um, is basically only focused on cutting um, and literally doesn't look at what we do at foreign aid. They're interested in, I would, I would say a great deal of the leadership of our Congress is actually interested in, in pretty specifically how much money they can cut from the federal budget and in the process how many programs they can exclude. Um, we actually were on an interesting track with many, many organizations in Washington with different faith-based and um, non-faith-based human rights and secular organizations. As recently as two years ago, um, we created something which still exists called MFAN, which stands for Modernizing Foreign Assistance Network. And it was a network of a large number of organizations. It's still being maintained and supported largely by a great um, Christian faith-based organization called Bread for the World. But we had really gotten the action and attention of the then um, uh, House of Representatives chair of the Foreign Aid Committee, who was Howard Berman from Los Angeles, to really work on modernizing foreign aid. So, but the Democrats are no longer in charge of the House. Um, Congressman Berman is in a, a ridiculous um, district fight running against another member of Congress. So he actually has his hands full. But in any event, the Congress is just not looking at that. I want to say, having said that, that there are great places in the administration, including in, US, in USAID, in the State Department, where they are looking at what they should be doing differently. It doesn't mean that they always actually think that they should be doing what I think they should be doing. And they're subject to huge numbers of lobbying um, pressures by a variety of special <laughs> interests. But even independent of the fact that the Congress isn't interested in doing anything except cutting their budgets, I think they really are trying to think about how to do things better. And one of the ways, reason, one of the arguments that we will make in this comprehensive fight for local and regional procurement is the fact that USAID had over the last five years a $60 million, which is tiny, $60 million pilot program in local and regional procurement. And they have, they're not published yet, but we know they have the results of that program, and we know it shows very favorably. And we're going to ask them to help us make that case to Congress. Thanks. Oh, good. You can, you know, line up. <laughs> a lot of people competing for the mic here. Well, my, my name is Paul. I'm a third year pre med student here at Brandeis. Um, I have several questions. Um, today, we talked a bit earlier about you know, how do we define social justice is really different from um, up to your interpretation. And I know that um, AJWS does work in many, many different fields, like in, in human rights and discrimination, poverty, and so many different scopes. How, how do you, um, and my question is how do you measure the impact? 
of your organizations and big, how do you manage the big, such, such a large scope of how you define social justice? Okay, well for me those are two separate questions. So um, uh, I'm not sure I can give you a definition of, so, a single definition of social justice, but um, as a human rights organization we are, we are deeply moved by the fact that um, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights actually spells out pretty clearly what the rights should be for all of the people in the world. Here's another quiz. Who wrote the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? Good. God, this is a smart campus you have here. Um, so, you know, it's pretty, it's so, so we're looking to protect those rights. Now those <laughs> rights um, translate into particular problems in particular countries today. So um, uh, I didn't talk about this because it wasn't enough time, but a lot of the agricultural work that we do is intensified by the fact that in many of these countries, including Haiti dramatically, there are no land rights. That is, there is no land title. Most people don't know who owns the land. But farmers, most of them, the majority of them women, have been farming for their families three and four generations on a particular plot of land. It's reasonable for them to imagine that they can keep farming there. But countries are coming, their own governments, and leasing or selling that land to outside agribusiness interests which is one of the reasons people are. So that's a pretty clear human rights issue in which, in which I think you can, we can comfortably argue that great injustices are being done against people who already are at the short end, and you heard a lot of Larry's statistics, in terms of how they live, and now they're losing pieces of their livelihood. So uh, for us, you know, justice, we, I would rather talk about expanding human rights and talk about the basic rights to health, um, to education, to escape from poverty. I think, I think it makes it a little bit finer. In terms of evaluation, which is a very powerful question, we actually are doing our evaluation um, on two or three different levels, and the higher levels is a new piece of our work. So previously, for much of our history, when we fund an organization, um, whatever the dollar amount we're giving them for their own vision of the work they want to do for sexual and reproductive rights, for um, agricultural sustainability, for post-conflict um, uh, tolerance and peace building, we would ask them, what's your plan for this money and how will you know that it's successful? And they would usually list many too many conditions and we would, we would winnow those down, so there were a few. We would add, encourage them to work with us to add metrics to some of them, so there were things to measure. And that's basically how we've evaluated the work to date. We are now much more engaged in developing more sophisticated monitoring and evaluation systems. First of all, having them, where it's possible, make use of computers. So you sort of ask and answer some questions once a quarter or once a year and get your own feedback and learn from your own feedback. I don't want to impose evaluation systems on organizations that won't be helpful to them. But what we're most interested in as the sort of next level is how do we work with clusters of our organizations to monitor progress on this human rights front, to move the human rights needle. So if I'm working with, as we are, a network of girls that are trying to, I mean, a, a, organizations that are trying to protect the rights of adolescent girls um, in Kenya, and they think that the country needs a law that against gender-based violence that is known to people, that is enforced by local and law, law authorities, you could develop with those groups what would be measures of the step toward the, the drafting, the articulation, the passage of that law, what would be measures that would say how, many, how, how their organizational effort is going. So just as I'm going to be measuring with staff how many people, uh, we're about to get 15,000 signatures on this petition we're asking you to sign later. That was our own threshold. We actually wanted to reach 15,000 by January 31st. So in my mind it's just still January 23rd. Um, uh, but no, but we're, we will get those 15,000 signatures, but it's like measures of that. Okay, how many campuses are we going to have groups actually working with us on reverse hunger? How many congregations are going to get involved and make this really an action agenda? So I, I think that monitoring, um, me me measurement monitoring and evaluation is critical to doing this work well. I just want to be sure the systems we develop are not a new level of onerous um, um, oppression of groups that are trying to change their lives. If I may, just in one, uh, just in a, a minute or less, just add to that, because I want to reinforce how unique Ruth's answer is. 
that you just heard in the international NGO community. Quite frankly, monitoring and evaluation is a weak point in most international NGOs. Right. It's a very difficult thing to do. And most international NGOs give lip service to it. And when they do it or try to do it, it's a very rigid set of requirements that are built in. And what it often does is discourage organizations that are your partner organizations from coming back to the donor organization, the partner here, and talking about problems that have come up. Because no, the process of development is very complicated. It's never going to go according to some plan that was written before the project is funded. It's always going to have to change. And I know under Ruth's leadership, and I mean this quite sincerely, AJWS is one of the few organizations that be, that's really thinking through what monitoring means. And in some respects, we believe monitoring is even more important than a kind of formal evaluation because it's the open dialogue. And AJWS is encouraging that. So I'm really, really pleased. Yes, sir. Hi. <clears throat> um, I'm Josh Bassages. I'm a sociology and politics uh, major senior here. Thank you for both of you guys for coming in. Uh, uh, it was really a pleasure to listen to your remarks. So clearly um, a lot of the work on the local level at least involves lobbying um, elected officials uh, to sort of push forward you know, the human rights agenda. Um, but as you mentioned, uh, there's lots of special interests also that are trying to lobby those same elected officials, um, often who have a lot more financial resources. So how does, how does organizations like um, the American Jewish World Service sort of leverage their resources, whether they're human resources or, or, or spreading uh, the mission through various congregations, and, and how can those resources be leveraged to sort of meet the special interests, and what are the role of students like us in doing that? You just answered all your own questions. <laughs> I, I don't have the money of Monsanto or Cargill, but I hope I have students on every campus. I hope I have growing numbers of congregations. When I say that this is our you know, I mentioned the International Violence Against Women Act. I mentioned the Convention on Child Soldiering because it drives me out of my mind. But we can't launch campaigns on every one of those issues. I can mention them when I talk to members of Congress. I can encourage members of Congress who have that already in their arsenal of things they'd like to move. But when we show up as American Jewish World Service in um, Washington, we want to be showing up increasingly with, like, we have one issue. And we can introduce you, and we do this, to heads of civil society organizations in Haiti who can tell you what it was like when American rice showed up on the airstrip without anybody buying rice from local farmers. We can get people to come here. Civil society leaders don't get invited to talk to our Congress. And in fact, there has only been one hearing in 25 months in Washington that featured leaders of civil society organizations in Haiti, and it was organized by the Congressional Black Caucus, and it is not an official congressional hearing. So we countered that by working with about 15 other groups, one of whom I'm happy to say got an anonymous gift that allowed the groups to, the group is, the informal network is called the Haiti Advocacy Working Group, and they were able to bring leaders of about 16 Haitian organizations, some of which are our grantees, some of which are others, to Washington for a week to talk to staff members of Congress, to talk to people in the State Department, and everybody's eyes get opened. Congress says, oh my God, there are people in Haiti really working on these issues. So, how do, so we're just looking to build those connections, but when I say that we're focusing on mobilizing and organizing, just sign up, you sign that petition. If we're worth our salt, you'll actually get an email from us that says, here's the critical date, here's what we'd like you to do on campus. The, the petition you'll see is very general, because we don't yet know who's going to introduce the amendment that says add these four words to the bill. But when we know that, every one of the people who signed the petition will hear about it. And I really want to go back to what Marcy said at the beginning. You know, everybody is just one person. Um, it's true that some of these corporations don't look like people to me, and the government <laughs> thinks they're people, and it's treating them very well. But change has been made consistently, it's what Jules and I were talking about at lunch, in this country by people getting their act together, by non-governmental organizations. We have a very, very good track record um, in the civil rights movement, in the women's movement, in the anti-war movements, plural, of, of people making mm -hmm. enough noise so members of Congress and elected officials had to listen. Great, thanks. Hello, my Hello. name is Sam Porter. Um, and both of you touched on our privilege and responsibility as Americans. 
um, and the global inequality that we face. We're like the 1% of the world in a sense. Um, and so I'm wondering if you think that as we gain this knowledge of our effects of our consumption, um, that we have individual, we have to make individual sacrifices and that because it's agreed the whole world cannot live like us, if we have to make national sacrifices and we cannot, we have to essentially give things up and what that would look like and if we have the capacity to do that. Um, I'm not sure it's a great question, Sam. I'm not sure I can tell you what, what it would look like, but you do make it sound sort of a little tragic. And I guess if you spend as much time um, traveling to the rest of the world as I've been privileged to do in the last 14 years, you think it would really be a good thing for everybody if we gave up some of this. That's the way I, that's the way I feel. So yes, there are, there are, when we talk about what our student volunteers who do service programs with us need to do when they come back, we talk about a, a six-pointed star. That's, you know, fortunate. Um, but it's learning, teaching, um, donating, doing additional service, doing advocacy and lobbying, and doing ethical consumption. So yeah, no one person here, no one perfect person is going to do all of those at some high standard, but those are the questions that we ought to be asking ourselves, is how do I use the 24th hour of my day? Um, what is it that I can do? And, and again, it's hard sometimes in the consumption universe to sort of be able to say one person makes a difference, but one person is one person is one person adds on. And we can think of lots and lots of stories of people um, who got ready and ended, and ended up making change. Um, and um, I don't know that I can, I don't feel comfortable sort of giving you the list of what are the things that we particularly are going to need to do less of or give up or change. But um, you know, you could pick almost any area in which you have a personal passion and think about it, and we're talking about um, hunger in a world that has enough grain to feed everybody. Um, if we did not, um, uh, and I am on the wrong side of this, I'm not, I'm not well behaved myself, but did, if, we not, if we did not as a country raise and consume so much meat, um, which is where <coughs> most of the grain in this country goes, we could do something better about, about assuming we could figure out the next steps in doing it about feeding the world. So that can be your issue, recycling, energy conservation can be your issue. My husband follows me around the room telling me to unplug my 4,000 electronic devices. <laughs> um, so everybody's got their own piece of this. But yeah, patterns of, of consumption in the world need to change to make the world, which as I said before, is interdependent, um, a more equitable place for everybody to live. Hi, my name is Ethan Goldberg, and I'm a senior here at Brandeis. Um, I want to make a claim, and then I want you to tell me why I'm wrong. That what? Uh, I'm going to make a claim, and then I want you to tell me why I'm wrong. Oh, oh okay. Um, I knew he said something important. I just didn't hear what he said. <laughs> Uh, so, how do you respond to criticism that the, uh, the Save Darfur movement that we've seen over the last 10 years um, was promoted by uh, a large plural, plurality of Jewish organizations, <coughs> including AJWS, to deflect criticism of Israel by focusing attention on a much worse human rights issue? I can't tell you why you're wrong because I just it's it's one person's opinion. It doesn't have any doesn't bear any truth to me. Okay. I'm, I run an organization that mobilizes the Jewish community to pay attention to issues and needs in the global south, which surely includes Africa. Three years, four years, when did I come? Ninety-eight. Six years, sorry. After I started working at this organization when it was very small, I picked up the New York Times and read probably the tenth op-ed in two months by Nicholas Kristof saying that there was a genocide in Africa, and we were still a very small organization. And I looked at my staff and I said, so let's get this straight. The New York Times columnist says there's a genocide in Darfur. No newspaper has published this. We are a people with a history that has involved a genocide. We know there have been genocides since the Holocaust. Nobody seems to be doing anything about this. And we're a Jewish organization that works in Africa. So if nobody's going to do it, I guess we ought to start it. And I am remain deeply moved by the response, first, of the American Jewish community, none of whom engaged in sort of pushing and shoving as I was there first or genocide is my business, all of whom worked collaboratively together and came into the Safe Darfur Coalition. I want to say that I know statistically 
that Jews did not play as big a role in the Save Darfur coalition as, they, as we like to think we do. The mobilization on um, the mall in April 2006, which Adam was involved in and which I was involved in, Adam actually brought Darfuri from Portland, Maine to that, so they were involved. But we actually did, a, we, we know the kind of organizing we did, which is what actually Jonathan asked me about before. That's your name, right, Jonathan? Josh, sorry, what Josh asked me about before, we did that kind of organizing for that rally. So we can actually tell you, we don't didn't keep the names, but we can tell you of the 25,000 people that we got to the mall, there were 75,000 people on the mall. Now that's a disproportionate um, to the population presence of the Jewish community, which seems to me to be appropriate in responding to a genocide. But our greatest partners in mobilizing people against the genocide in Darfur and our continuing greatest partners in mobilizing on, for peace in Sudan and against the forthcoming famine is the National Association of Evangelicals. So let's not claim too much to ourselves. But we did it because we were concerned about that. And many Jews who were working against the genocide in Darfur were also working on issues of, which I think is what you're referencing, Mideast peace. And many of them were working on issues of um, trying to save and promote and expand American democracy. There, there's room in most of our lives and brains um, for working on di many different issues that we're passionate about without imagining that one is created to stop work on another. Thank you. Others? Okay, I am really impressed with the, the um, determined attention of the Brandeis students to the front of the room when I know there's food in the back of the room. <laughs> so why don't we um, adjourn informally, Larry, if you want to say, oh, yes, going to no, no, close Marcy us out. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Let me formally adjourn with one more thanks again to President Ruth Messenger, former President Larry Simon, President Lawrence, President Herbie Rosen, the Dice <laughs> Impactors, all the 32 co-sponsoring clubs and departments who've worked really hard to make this week something kind of magic. Um, I hope you'll join us at some of the rest of the week's events, including starting right now across the way at this Shapiro Campus Center atrium, BADASS, which of course stands for Brandeis Academic Debate and Speech Society, asking what makes for a just welfare state. So if you'd like to see this national award-winning debate team discuss this question with the audience having a chance to weigh in with short speeches as well, Join us in the Shapiro Campus a Center atrium tonight and some of the other Dice Impact events during the week. And thank you all for coming. And thank sign, you. sign the Reverse Hunger Petition. And tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, um, Lisa Exler from the AJWS staff, who is uh, um, an undergraduate and graduate degree holder from Brandeis, will be speaking on a panel um, here in Hassenfeld. One more round of applause for Ruth and Larry. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>